give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. Here's the story. It says Jesus entered Jericho, and there was a man that was passing through. He was passing through. A man by the name of Zacchaeus was there, and he was the chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. A little Bible context, context. He wasn't just like a, a, a wealthy dude. He was absolutely hated by all. He was hated by all segments of society because he was wealthy, and the way he got his wealth was even worse. Long story, but just know this guy was hated. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Here we have the first biblical example of somebody inviting themselves over for dinner. Incredible. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Can I just tell you this, y'all? I pray you're living the kind of life where somebody is muttering and grumbling and blogging and tweeting and misunderstanding you because when you're pleasing God, often you're going to displease some people. But then you got to ask yourself who you're working for. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said, Lord, look, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this home because this man is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Come on, somebody. That deserves a Pentecostal shout down something. You know why I love this? Because Jesus shows up and turns a dinner meeting into a revival moment where it leads to somebody else's salvation. I believe till the end of time, what Jesus was teaching us is not about what the label the world wants you to have. It's about the label that God has given you. Jesus just showed up, reaches somebody in a tree, and the next thing you know, somebody's etern eternity is completely different. I don't care what somebody else has called you. I don't care what you walked in here thinking you do or don't have. If you have the anointing of our God, you have the right to be able to walk through wherever you're walking, look up into some trees where nobody else is looking and realize God can use me here. Does that encourage anybody else? Every time I read this story, it blows me away. When you get this, you're no longer just a anything. You are a walking revival. You know why I say this? There are a lot of people in your age bracket who are thinking, well, right now I'm just a college student, but there's gonna be a moment. Right now I'm just a, no way. When you get the Occupy All Streets revelation, you're no longer just an anything. You are an agent of change called by God to impact people wherever you go. Changes. I remember hearing a story of a police officer who uh, wrote me an email and he said, you know, I used to think that my ministry was going to be after I was done being a police officer because our world, keep in mind, we have put some callings with the VIP label and others with not so VIP. But this guy said, I thought someday I was going to be a pastor and I was going to start my ministry and then I started hearing messages and reading the Bible and realizing I don't know what I'm waiting for. I don't have to have someone call me an evangelist or call me a pastor to actually start reaching some people. He said, so what I started doing as a police officer, I would always arrest people, put them in the back of the car and take them to the station. And he said, that wasn't good enough anymore. I said, I'm going to occupy my street a little differently and I'm going to be prepared in case God needs me. So what I do now is I will arrest somebody, I'll throw them in the back of my car and on the way to the police station, I'll just hold up a video link of one of y'all's sermons and I'll just play them the word of God because where are they going to go? And he said, by the time we got to the station, some people would be weeping, not because they were about to go to jail, but because of what they heard. Some people would have questions. Sometimes dudes would get out of jail, come track me down and say, can you tell me a little bit more about what you were playing in that car? Because something gripped my heart. What if I told you that God has a story and a plan for you, and it includes you leaving this conference, not forgetting your responsibility to shine the light of the gospel? There's a woman in my church who's a hero. She's a four-time cancer survivor, double mastectomy. She's Puerto Rican. She is fierce. Any Puerto Ricans in the place? Hey, seven, awesome. All you need is two. Place gets live. And she said to me, after her fourth bout with cancer, 
And I said, how you doing, Arlene? Are you okay? Are your spirit's high? She said, of course, I'm good. She said, I believe God's my healer, even though I haven't seen my healer. I believe that God's my source. I'm going to be all right. She said, matter of fact, I've just prayed for my healing, but now I'm focused on reaching my chemotherapy uh, people in the room with me. She said, last week I brought eight of them to church. You know, they got saved. And this week, you know, I walk in there and I keep reminding the devil, you should have killed me when you had a chance because I don't want to be in this chemo room, but if I'm going to be in this chemo room, I'm going to actually look for somebody to reach. She said, now that's my mission field. So as long as I got cancer, I'm going to make the devil pay for putting me in that hospital. As long as I don't have my hair and I love my hair, I'm going to make the devil pay for giving me this disease. I'm right now, I'm going to fight for people. What are we doing? as Christians that know the gospel, know the beauty of our God, but yet we are hesitant to give the greatest news of all. I pray you leave here going, I'm gonna occupy my street. I don't care if people don't think I'm qualified, God qualified me. I don't care how bad my past is, I know that Jesus said old things are gone, the new things are here, I am gonna reach somebody. It's not about what we're saying, it's about what Jesus has already done. And if we will open up our lives, we can see things like this matter. Can I give you two ways quickly to occupy your street? Just two suggestions. Number one, I propose that you occupy wide awake. There's probably more joy in this journey than you have seen in your life just yet. Occupy wide awake. What I love about Jesus walking in through this town, keep in mind he had somewhere else to go and I'm sure you're busy, but I don't think you were as busy as Jesus would have been. Jesus is walking through on the way to somewhere else, and he is so wide awake that he passes a tree and sees somebody in there and turns it into a revival moment. Been sitting over there watching people worship and trying to hear the voice of God, and I feel prompted to plead with somebody in here that God's word for you right now would be to wake up because he's doing more than you know. He's working in ways that you cannot see. And I believe it's human nature to want to close our eyes to the beauty of our God every day and just get caught in the monotonous flow of life. Just another day, another struggle. Gym flow, work flow, school flow, quiet time flow, hashtag. Another day, another struggle. We just go and we just go and slowly but surely we close our eyes to the supernatural because it doesn't look spectacular forgetting that God loves to intervene in the super normal and use nobody's like us to tell anybody's like the people outside about the somebody who can change their life. But we've got people that are walking around like they're asleep. I don't want to get caught as a Christian living rushed because I wasn't ready. You know what I mean by that? Have you ever like overslept an alarm? Worst thing ever, right? The rest of your day you're rushed and you're running all around, you got the wrong shoes on, you're fighting with people you don't wanna fight with, you just feel totally rushed because you weren't ready, because you overslept. I think some Christians are in that position where they're never actually present in the now because they weren't ready, they weren't awake to what God is doing. And what if I told you way up there in the back that God is doing more than you're seeing? What if I told you last year that God was blessing you in areas you didn't recognize, that he was working in ways you did not see? Our job is to keep our eyes wide open to the goodness of our God. Somebody in here, you need to wake up because God wants to use you to shine the light of the gospel on the street that you are occupying right now. In our church, we do these things called for Monday, meaning we don't want people to shout us down on Sunday and do nothing on Monday. If we're having good church meetings on the weekend, but nobody's changing lives on the weekdays, we are failing miserably. If nothing changes on your campus this Monday, what we've done this week doesn't really matter all that much. Our prayer is that this will not be a moment, it would be a movement, something you could put into practice. In a couple days from now, for Monday, wake up and ask yourself this question, who can I serve? Is that profound enough, theologically sound for everybody? Who can I serve? Think about Jesus. What if he would have walked around like some of us do? It's not my moment. It's not my week to serve. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't walk by Zacchaeus. Like, not now, buddy. I'm a Scorpio. It's not my time right now. It's not what I do. I'm having an introspective season. What if you woke up, started saying, who can I serve? 
Who can I love? What can I do? God, how can you use me? I promise you, you will see fruit on your street. I promise you, you will start to see God move in ways you did not expect, but here's the hitch. Don't get discouraged when it doesn't happen instantly because God is working constantly. We are the Instagram generation, y'all. People just want to watch Sports Center highlights. They don't want to see the game. People want to see the photograph, like the final picture. No one wants to know the story. But anytime you see men and women of God that have done great things, please understand there was a great price of monotony they paid to wake up every day and go, who am I going to serve? I don't care about the return. Obedience is my job. Outcome is God's job. I'm going to wake up every day and I'm going to be kind. I'm going to help somebody. I'm not just going to go to school to take classes. I'm going to go to have God use me. You want me to show up to school today with a happy spirit? So be it. You want me to go to church and hold a door? So be it. You want me to turn the other cheek when somebody's being bad to me? So be it. My job on this planet is to live an open life, to be generous with people so they can see the beauty of my God through my broken life. Wake up. I want to encourage some of you in here that have been trying to minister to people and you haven't seen much fruit. Nobody Instagrams the bad days in church. Nobody talks about the Bible studies on the campuses that you're trying to start and it's not going well. Can I, number one, tell you that you're a hero and that God's doing things that you cannot see? Remain wide awake. Do not quit. Do not stop. You keep loving people and God will use your life. Can somebody say amen? They agree with me on this. Don't leave. Don't leave the the room because it's not working. Have y'all ever sat through one of those old, bad, like scary movie flicks where you have like the totally predictable plot line where the guy's out there doing bad things and there's always that party scene, typically it's at a college and people are dancing and there's always that one random girl, typically a white girl, and she's like, I'm gonna go outside for no apparent reason. Even though people have been murdered out there for weeks, I'm just gonna go take a walk outside. And she goes outside, and people are in the theater yelling at the screen as if you can change the narrative of a screenplay that's been written. Don't go out there, girl. Don't go out there. There's a killer out there. Why would you leave? Stay in there. And then you watch as she floats on into the forest, and she never comes back. You're like, ah! I wonder sometimes if heaven heaves with the same kind of passion telling people like you and I when we're tempted to get out because we don't see it working. I wonder if we would just stay in a little bit longer, if we would keep praying a little bit longer, if we would keep pressing into God just a little bit longer. People we're believing for, they will find God. People that we want to see help, they will get help. But some of you, I pray today that you remain wide awake to the goodness of our God. Number two, as we close, I want you to occupy with urgency. The clock is ticking, Passion Conference, and we need to get moving. I pray there's some urgency rising up in you even as we're preaching right now. Because the clock is ticking, and we gotta get moving. I love this moment with Jesus because he could have put it off, could have done something else, but he looked at this guy who was not on his plan for the day, was not part of his calendar meetings, and he looked at Zacchaeus and he said, I'm coming to your house, we're having dinner right now. Love that. I wonder if there are times where we don't realize the urgency of the situation. I pray that in this room right now you would realize this big differential moment here. Urgency doesn't make you weird, it just makes you effective. Because sometimes when we think of urgency, we think of the weird Christians who do weird things and they're pressing people. I don't believe true God-given urgency makes you weird. I believe it makes you effective because you wake up every day going, this could be the day. I pray that your future is bright and I pray that you have a long life ahead of you. But the essence of the gospel was originally preached to people that were probably going to die with a very short lifespan. So everything you see in the New Testament, sometimes you feel the urgency. We have missed this in our culture. We have limited time to occupy these streets. And I pray somebody in here, you're already feeling, oh my gosh, Lord, there's things I have to do and there's people I have to reach. And here's the best news ever. Even if you're not from 
I guess there's people from all over the world in here, but in New York City, there is such a void of kindness and generosity that if you are urgent with your kindness and you are urgent with your gentle spirit and the hope that is Jesus Christ moving through your life, you will stand out like a sore thumb. You don't need a mixtape. You don't need to have a lot of followers on Twitter. You just have to show up on the job every day as a New Yorker and just be a little bit kind and people will be blown away. You can open a door for somebody and people will be like, oh my gosh. Do you know that our world is so broken and so sick that if you would stop looking at you and start looking at Jesus, not what you lack, but what he has put in you, you would actually urgently step out more than you do because this gospel is really about the hand-to-hand -hand combat, person-to-person, -person, woman to woman reaching people every day. That's what the gospel is to me. I remember walking in New York and people have said to me, oh, Carl, you're an evangelist. And I'll say, I, I don't agree with you at all. I think I'm just urgent. And I'm sick of watching people die and I'm sick of going to funerals and I'm sick of watching the devil rob people with this lie that is sin so when God opens up a door I'm gonna step in there I don't care if I look like an idiot I don't care if I say the wrong thing which is typically 99% of the time what we do I'll just take a moment one of the biggest evangelistic weapons I have in my life is my love of shoes I found myself on the subway one day and I was just next to a guy and I was like hey man because in New York City you can be this close to people and they try to act like you're not existing Say, hey man, cool shoes. He's like, thanks, yours are cool too. I'm like, you wanna come to church? I got a good church down the road, God's changed my life. He's like, yeah, I've been thinking about that. My heart's hurt, you know, I got some broken areas. That'd be pretty cool, where is it? There was no cloud. There was no David Crowder. There was no Louis talking about faith and God and awesomeness. There was just a subway and a window and a fallible broken vessel that has at least learned one thing God can use broken vessels like me to somehow shine the light on the perfect Savior that he is what if you woke up on Monday with an urgent expectation that today is the day I'm gonna walk by some trees that other people have overlooked and God is gonna use my life but I pray that you are willing to do whatever it takes. You are in this game, meaning you have committed your life to Jesus. You are just as effective as anybody else. God can use your life. Your call is holy. I love that. But the very first person that got saved at Hillsong, New York City, it was also the very first person that we did a funeral for. And his story is unbelievable because he was a product of New York City through and through. Arrested over 20 times worked in nightclubs, he was a model, he was a bartender, he had struggled with years and years of abuse, and I used to invite him to church, because he used to say, I don't, want, I don't want you to talk to me about Jesus. Now, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. And I'd say, well, Jesus is God, so just be quiet, just keep on coming. And he would start coming to church, and he would always let me know, he's like, I'm not coming to church for any other reason than there's girls in there. And I'm like, that's fine, you know, just, just keep on coming, whatever it takes, I mean, people can handle it, keep on coming. And week after week, he would sit there and I would watch his face change, just being around the glory of God, watching God do what he can do through broken people like our church is filled with. And I remember the day that he came running down the stairs to tell me, he said, Carl, I got saved in my quiet time today. I did something uh, that you guys always say to do. I read my Bible and I was just praying and somehow I understand this and I'm a Christian today and it's awesome. And I remember thinking that's the craziest story ever because I thought it was gonna happen a different way but it happened like that. And he told me something before he passed away. He said, Carl, you know what did it for me? He said, you know how you always get people to turn to each other and how it's all awkward? Well, I secretly used to say it was awkward but I used to like it because I don't talk to anybody all week. He said, I didn't talk to anybody all week. And he said, sometimes people would hug me and I used to hate it I used to hate it and I used to say no I'm not coming to church today no one's gonna hug me but secretly I would come to church I mean music is all right and you're preaching it is what it is but I used to come waiting for those hugs because no one's hugged me for years and I'd act like I didn't like it but he said week after week people kept hugging me and I would try to act like I didn't want it but I would just kind of look around for hugs 
Because we take a moment in church and we just say, hey, give somebody a hug. And he used to say, week after week, I felt like it was God chipping away at this icy cold heart. And there came a day where there was nothing left. And I saw Jesus for who he was. It was not our music, which is overrated. It was not the preaching of churches that gets the credit. It was not that. It was the hugs of everyday, ordinary people that came into church going, I can't sing today. I'm not preaching today. I don't have a label today. But what is God going to call me to do? I guarantee you. There was nobody in our church that thought God's going to use me to be the hug that breaks the camel's back in that regard. No, people just saying, what's it going to be today, Lord? Can I plead with you? Maybe take my word for it that our world is so broken. And there are people that are so desperate that if we can go back to Matthew 5, 13 and just say, God, help me to shine. We're going to be in moments like this, but there are going to be more people different nationalities, different races. We can be a part of something in our lifetime where we look back and say, wow, look at what God did with a bunch of broken people like us. I want you to use me. Because there have been some moments in my life that have shaped me and wrecked me forever. And one of them was being in a meeting like this in Sydney, Australia almost the same amount of people. And I was standing next to a guy who had just graduated from Teen Challenge, which is a phenomenal rehab place for young men and women to go through. And there were people jumping up and down and worshiping and he was sitting down and he was weeping. And his story is is hard to hear. Sexually abused at a young age, spun him out in every various way you can imagine. Addicted to heroin, almost died somehow by the grace of God, he was still going, got saved, and he sat there, he was weeping. And I looked at him, I sat down, I said, why are you, why are you crying? And he looked at me and I will never forget his words because every time I come into a conference, I feel like it's what the Holy Spirit reminds me with. He looked at me and he said, I wish somebody would have told me sooner. He said, all these people worshiping, known about this God, he said, I wish somebody would have told me sooner I've been lonely I've been alone if somebody would have invited me I would have came if somebody would have told me I would have listened I just wish somebody would have told me sooner and I remember sitting there in that meeting going God I can't do anything about what he's going through but I want to be that somebody that gets a hold of somebody else before this world has a chance to rob what God wants to do in their life my prayer for you in this room is that you would not wait another day to allow God to use you to occupy your street. If you're on a college campus, you are the revival. If you work at a gas station, you are the revival. If you're waiting for a breakthrough, stop. We already had a breakthrough. It happened on that cross and on that Calvary Hill where Jesus broke through the grave so Christians would never have to wait another day.